Welcome to Your Path to Nonprofit Leadership, the weekly podcast that features the very best in career development in the nonprofit sector. I'm your host, Patton McDowell, and I'm committed to bringing you ideas and resources that will enhance your professional development plan. Now, whether you are tuning in for the first time or are a regular listener, I'm glad to have you. If you want to be a nonprofit leader or maybe just more effective in the role you're in now, you're in the right place. I'm glad to bring you these weekly conversations with nonprofit experts who are really on the cutting edge of our sector. And if you would do me a favor, find the share button. Usually it's at the top of the episode graphic in the device you're holding right now. Uh, share this episode, maybe text it, email it just to one other person, and we can continue to build a global community focused on nonprofit leadership. Well, I had a fantastic conversation this episode with Mike St. Pierre and is perhaps one of the few people I've encountered that has an equal, if not greater, focus on all things productivity. Mike and I are clearly kindred spirits. I think he and I were both reading David Allen's Getting Things Done 20 years ago, and we had a fantastic conversation that will allow you to think about your productivity and how you can be more effective as a nonprofit leader. Now, Mike is literally a gold mine of resources on this topic, uh, but this conversation is much more than just a list of tools and tricks. Now, we got plenty of tools and tricks, so make sure you check out the show notes for that. But what is so helpful is that Mike is, in fact, a nonprofit leader himself, and he's thoughtful and practical in his advice on the subject because he understands the position you're in right now as a nonprofit leader. You're not just trying to churn through your to-do list, but you're actually trying to get the right things done, both personally and professionally. Mike's going to help you do just that. And make sure you check out the show notes because there are lots of links and references to some of the tools that he is suggesting for your review. This is episode number 146. Just go to the podcast or the news page at patentmcdowell.com and you'll find out about all these resources as well as more information on Mike and the great work he's doing through the nonprofit productive. Now, speaking of resources, while you're on our website, check out the new book page. It's the tab at the top of the homepage. It's labeled book. And yes, indeed, we're less than two weeks away from the publication of my book called Your Path to Nonprofit Leadership. Very excited about that and the opportunity over the last two years to do some research and put together feedback, thoughts, and ideas, and hopefully a practical tool for you as you contemplate your journey on the path to nonprofit leadership. Comes out March 8th, 2022. Love for you to have a copy. Share with your friends and colleagues in the nonprofit space. And tell me what you think uh, so we can continue to build on the concepts within the book that are also translated into our mastermind program. And so if that is something of interest to you, that's also available on the website. Find out more or just simply reach out. Let us know if you have any questions. And we'd be happy to discuss your nonprofit organization or maybe more importantly, your journey to nonprofit leadership. Without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Mike St. Pierre. Mike, thank you for joining me on the path. Great to be here, Pat, and thanks for having me. Well, I'm excited about this conversation. You and I share a passion, if not obsession, with uh, productivity and all things uh, helping particularly nonprofit leaders stay organized. And it, it seems like such an appropriate topic right now. Mike, you and I both have lots of colleagues in this space who are, I would say, exhausted, you know, if not overwhelmed by the volume of activity and work they're trying to manage in doing great work to achieve the mission of their nonprofits. So, you're a perfect person to talk to. You have gone deep in this and have great resources and wisdom to offer. And let me start with that, though. As you have conversations with nonprofit leaders all over the country, what do you think are the, the biggest challenges they're facing right now? Well, I definitely agree with you, Patton, that exhaustion is significant. And I think that a lot of nonprofit leaders that I work with, and I'm very fortunate to work with folks all over the country, um, they were working very hard before the pandemic. And I think that if they had any gaps or leaks or an Achilles heel or two in their productivity system, I think that the pandemic has sort of exacerbated that maybe has, um, you know, revealed some areas for improvement or just 
parts of their work on a day-to-day basis that weren't great. And they were relying on just a ton of passion, great work ethic, a real heart for their mission. And the pandemic happens and they're forced to work remotely and try to do everything they were doing before, but with new tools and a new context and in new ways. And and I think the the final product is just a real sense of fatigue and tired. um, And also just the sense of, do I want to keep doing this the way I did it before? Uh, can I work smarter and not harder because I've found some, maybe some silver linings over the last couple of years that I maybe, maybe I don't want to let go of those, right? right. Like I'm, I'm working from home a little bit more or a lot more and gosh, I'm seeing there are some benefits for that. Uh, you know, I work with primarily folks who work on, on college campuses and, you know, parking on a college campus <laughs> is a <laughs> unique challenge. And I don't think anyone has missed that uh, during parts of, of the pandemic over the last couple of years. So yeah, I would just say it's a refining of tools and pace. And uh, that's coupled with this still a sense of tangible tiredness that a lot of nonprofit leaders have. So well put. And as one who spent 10 years in higher education, yes, I remember circling the campus on more than one occasion <laughs> and, and being very stressed about the next meeting that, frankly, I was going to be late for. Um, well, Mike, how does your journey affect the work uh, you're doing now? I mean, were many of the lessons learned, it sounds like maybe directly, or were you always kind of focused on efficiency and productivity in some of these elements? Well, my wife will tell you that it is a bit of a superpower and, and a kryptonite built in for me. Uh, <laughs> Both. You know, yeah, I, I, I can remember in middle school, no joke, Patton, I remember taking great pride in my daily uh, piece of paper where I'd write down all my assignments for the day. You know? and, and I look back at that and I say, gosh, that's pretty nerdy stuff. But <laughs> there, were, there were some warning signs early And then from there, you know, I mean, for me, uh, an afternoon of fun was going to the Franklin Covey store at the mall, (laughs) you know, and, and picking out my planner refills for the year. I know that's, that's either really sad or exciting, depending (laughs) on who's listening to this. Um, So yeah, I've always had a sense of um, just if there's a, a faster way to do something or a slightly more efficient way, I'm really interested in that and, and certainly in work, but but not just in work. I'll give you a really silly example. So um, my kids would occasionally for school, um, let's see, they would be late or or maybe have to get out early for a doctor's appointment or something like that. Right. And so the school would have a paper form that you would have to fill out. And so I asked the principal, I said, if I could figure out a better way to do that, would you be open to it? And she said, sure. So I figured out how to uh, create a QR code, which would then trigger an email to the front desk admin. And then all I would have to do is scan it in. I'd just put it on the side of my refrigerator, I'd scan it in and it would automatically populate this email. And I would just have to fill in the date and the reason why they were late or early to wow. school. And I, my kids were mortified, but I took <laughs> great pride in that. Um, so, so yes, I guess just a long way of saying this is a big part of, of my life, my way of working and living. And I'm always looking for just a more efficient way to do things. I guess just last thing I'll say is when I came across David Allen's work and the book, yes. getting things done, that was profound for me. And then I, I've had been fortunate. I've had the opportunity to interview him several times over the years. And I met him once and, and that has not left me, you know, I mean, you and I are both avid readers and we're really trying to grow and have that growth mindset, but I have found that getting things done remains significant for me. And, um, and it, it, you know, one of the key principles is just, there are smarter ways to get things done and you don't have to white knuckle it with every task you do. So well put. And you and I share that inspiration from David Allen. I distinctly remember, you know, gosh, it was almost 20 years ago, probably when I first read it and and was struck by that and and, uh, delighted that you have continued to apply it. I know to your own life, but also to all the folks that you're helping and working with. In fact, for our listeners, uh, you know, Mike, that don't know you, talk about the work you do now. What exactly do you do? 
Sure. I'm an executive director of a faith-based professional association, and we provide professional development for folks who work in higher education all over the country. So we're providing online and in-person training for, a, well, that's a good question. We have you know just under 600 formal members, but we'll serve a good 400 others in the course of the year. Um, our market space is small. There's only about 1,200 individuals around the country who do the particular work that our members do. Okay. Um, and so it's a great gift. Um, prior to being an executive director, I was president of a, of a high school in Northern New Jersey. And before that was in middle school and high school work in a variety of different capacities. So uh, I lead a small team. We have a board. Uh, we run events and conferences like many of your listeners, I'm sure. And um, you know, we're looking for ways to help them be as effective as they can be on college campuses, serving students. And so a number of things probably that we'll talk about today, we've actually started to teach to our members. Um, and, you know, we did a series on remote work at the very beginning of COVID because we realized that our team has been working remotely for a number of years and many of our members had not. Right. So we could probably share a few things. And, so that's what I do. I, I live in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Uh, my wife, Carrie, and I are married 24 years this summer. We have four wonderful children. And so, you know, our life is really, it, it has been committed to the nonprofit sector in a variety of different spaces. And um, I wouldn't have it any other way. It's different. It's, um, but it's been very conducive to having family life, having hobbies, having activities. Um, I, I would say when I ran a high school, that was an all-consuming 24-7 kind of activity. Um, and so I am very grateful for these last six years that it's just been a more sustainable pace that I hope is going to allow me <laughs> to continue to do it for, for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you describe well, I think, many of that 24-7 feeling. A lot of our colleagues and folks listening right now um, is... The challenge, I guess, because, well, first of all, let me commend you. The content you produce, I know, benefits your members, but frankly, I think it benefits nonprofit leaders in any sector. And for those members, it is the hard part. They, they can't even grasp, I guess, the, the treadmill they're on or what, what is the typical member that comes to you and says, Mike, you know, help me. How do you even start there, Mike? What is that kind of initial assessment, mm -hmm. I suppose, like? Yeah, that's a great question, Patton. So my my side work that's really also very fun uh, and is informed by my executive director work. So this side work is is a, a, a consultancy that I'm starting called Nonprofit Productive, and that's really helped me to lean into the rest of the nonprofit space. You know, so most of my day work is in the faith based nonprofit space. And, you know, here's the thing, there's over a million nonprofits in the United States and, and many don't have a faith foundation and are doing incredible work and have right. the same, the same pain points as people in other sectors. So nonprofit productive has given me that, that opportunity. I would say the, it's the pain points and the struggles that typically bring people to me, you know, the sense of feeling overwhelmed by email the sense of being exhausted from too many meetings, the sense of being out of control. In other words, just waking up knowing, oh my gosh, I didn't do this, or I forgot that, or what about that? And so those, those bruises or pain points, if you will, that's typically what brings people <laughs> to my website and some of our resources. Um, I would say the other thing is they, there is a tangible desire um, or a curiosity to, to get better. Uh, I, my, our board, I remember at a meeting recently in Chicago, I don't know, it was just during like the cocktail hour and I was just geeking out a little bit. And I said, <laughs> Oh, what, what email app do you use on your phone? What calendar app do you use? What do you do for this? What about that? And I was shocked because to a person, all of them said, Oh, I just use the mail built in app. Uh, I just use the built-in calendar app. I just, you know, what do you use for project? Man I just use reminders. And I just thought none of that's bad, but there might be an opportunity to play at a higher level, to be more efficient. And I would imagine, you know, I like, I 
to me, using built-in apps a lot of times feels like uh, fingernails on the chalkboard. You know, like <laughs> right, right. Once you get hooked on Text Expander or Fantastical or Natural Language Input or you know shortcuts, it's hard to go back. You know, or keyboard shortcuts. I mean, my goodness, you know, my fingers just fly across the keyboard. So I am continually stunned that folks haven't been uh, exposed to some of these just efficiencies or, you know, hacks, tips, tricks, strategies, whatever you want to call it. And that's kind of exciting to me because it reminds me there's still a lot of work to be done. Well, and it allows uh, obviously someone who achieves that efficiency as you have to get more of the important work, right? The mission driven work done. And in fact, maybe you could speak to this, Mike, because I think a lot of times I, I run into folks who I believe think, well, the, the productivity stuff is just kind of getting more done. You know, it's a quantitative exercise and I'm still going to stay up all night. And, and I'm sure you, you would suggest that no, it's, it's getting the right things done, right? It's getting the right things done. It's freeing you up. And I think, I hate to use that phrase, climbing the ladder, right? Because it, it just connotes I don't know. It just, it feels <laughs> right. off. However, there is a sense that our, our work is important in the nonprofit space. It's really important. And hopefully the longer we do it, the more we can accomplish and the bigger our impact can be. And so I think with that mindset, then there are certain tasks that match that, you know? And so it's never to say that like, I'm a huge believer in servant leadership um, it's why I picked the doctoral program that I did because they had a, a focus in servant leadership, but yeah, yeah. nobody's beyond taking out the trash. Nobody's beyond doing the little things. And I just think there's an important uh, mindset for a leader that they are paid to do the most important things and they have to be clear what those important things are. And so, gosh, if a keyboard shortcut will help you do the most important things and save you time. I think that's a no brainer, you know, yep. or if having an app that you might have to pay $2 a month for will help you be the most efficient person you can be. Again, I think that's a no brainer. So, um, you know, it's, it's a little awkward talking about it. Cause you, I never like you, I never want to think like, Oh, well, I'm too good for that task or, you know, no, not at all. It's just that we want the biggest payoff because we have a certain set of gifts and skills to leave the biggest impact on planet earth. And so we want to align our tasks to that. Yeah. I love the way you uh, put that in a philosophic sense. And you know, I've been involved in a number of searches for senior leaders in the nonprofit sector. And again, it's not, and I'm sure you're the same way. You're not trying to dictate exactly which app or which trick or tip no. they use. However, I do think uh, leaders in our sector do need to have a system in place to assure they're getting the right things done. In other words, I know you have a to-do list maybe of, you know, 55 things, but my question to you is, all right, but how do you know that you're going to get the right things done? You know, because I just see a lot of folks I think are on this treadmill of, you know, staying up all night and they're emailing me, you know, 24 seven, but I'm concerned they're not getting the right thing. So I'm guessing, Mike, you also kind of help people assure they're getting the right things done, not just more things done. Definitely. I think there are certain, um, routines that make that possible, that clarity of what's the most important thing done. You know, so a, one routine could be a board meeting and then the ED has a report that they have to submit for that. You know, right. that's, that's really an important uh, road sign, you know, along the way, and you're going to get feedback and it jogs your own reflection. Like, did I really produce enough in the last quarter? You know, so that I think those routines are important. Another routine on a personal level would be a weekly review. So, you know, again, in getting things done parlance, a weekly review is just that once a week check-in where you look back at what you did, you look forward to what's coming up, you evaluate and assess, you make sure things aren't falling through the cracks. So I think those couple of different routines are really important. Another one could be, you know, a meeting cadence with your team, yes. you know, whether it's weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, whatever it might be. We just introduced in our team a twice a year strategy meeting um, to complement our uh, weekly meetings. And we found that really, really helpful um, because we find that we're busy just spinning a lot of plates. We're kind of program heavy right now. Right. Um, and, and we're kind of always trying to get a feel for, 
are we doing too many programs? You know, because we don't just want to do programs. We want to move the needle on bigger things. Um, so, so I think some of those routines are important. The other thing I will say is the, there are certain lenses that are important that help us make sure we're doing the right things. A lens of your organization's strategic plan. Yep. You know, and so to touch that regularly, to reference it, to let it inform the, the practices that are taking place each week. I think that's very, very important. And so what I found for many years, I did this in a very poor way where I would promise myself that I would touch the strategic plan and I wouldn't, you know, and so we would do so much work on the front end and then not to really use it. It was kind of a waste, right? So what I learned over time was that the ability to match a theme with a day is for me much more effective than just wishful thinking and thinking, right. you know, oh, I'll probably get to that. No, I won't. I will not get to that strategic plan unless I build it in and schedule it as if it were as important as, as this conversation we're having now. So that's been helpful too. theming days, um, the lens of strategic plan, and then those kind of organizational and personal routines that's helped me certainly a work in progress, but I'd be curious to hear, you know, how you advise leaders in that sense too. Well, it, 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 well first of all, thank you. We're getting bonus content out of you, Mike. I know <laughs> this episode is going to feature five of your best uh, productivity moves for nonprofit <laughs> leaders. And maybe you're alluding to some of them in this discussion for me though, the one you hit on, and I know my colleagues and friends are smiling right now at the weekly review that like for you, was a game changer and it has remained for me. It's an early Saturday morning ritual where I do exactly as you describe, go back through the calendar because inevitably I remember things that I didn't uh, on at the time. And I look ahead and, and help myself prepare. And I just think so many of our colleagues, understandably, you get caught in the day to day grind and then you lose track of something. So for me, that is always an advice or a piece of advice like you offer, which is do your weekly review so that things don't get lost because it inevitably will happen. Um, but let's let's use that that launching pad, Mike. You, you've got dozens of ideas I know you could uh, share with us, but you believe there are five maybe kind of high level ones that you wanted to share. So let's start with it. What is your number one key productivity move? Here we go. It's called simple task management. And by this, we mean it is critical and very, very basic, but everyone should start their day with a simple list of things they want to get done. No, maybe not your Saturday, maybe not your Sunday, sure. but at, at least during the work week, it's so important to just not show up. And I, I, for me, this became true because I was a teacher for many years and you simply could not show up on Monday without at the very least, a full day of, of coursework planned, ideally a whole week of, right. of items planned. It was, and I remember talking, my brothers, one was in finance, one was in software. And I would say, guys, like how much work do you have to do on the weekend to get ready for the week? And they would say, well, none, we just show up on Monday. <laughs> and I just, as a nonprofit person, I couldn't do that, you know, and I still can't do that. So that's the first one is just having a simple list of items that you hope to accomplish in the course of the day. In my mind, I use a combination of digital tools and old fashioned paper. Yep. I think each person needs to find what works for them, but keep it simple, stick to it. And don't you want to get to dinner time feeling like you have accomplished a few things? <laughs> so I know that sounds so anticlimactic and so basic, but there are an awful lot of people who are just flying by the seat of their pants, as opposed to having a, a simple task management system. Well, and it gets to your point. And, and I think that what we discussed is that there's more chance of not getting the right things done if you're just in scramble mode or catch up mode. So that clarity you're bringing to your morning ritual assures that maybe the right things are going to get done, you know, not just what everything on your to do list. I, I guess, Mike, to, to others that say, well, what about why shouldn't I do it the night before? or do it at the end of the day, or are, are you agnostic as to the timing? Is, but are you, do you believe the morning is the right time to do it? No, I'm Switzerland. Um, I actually think, you know, if nighttime works better, if you have a nighttime shutdown ritual, that can be very effective. Ideally, and I'm a big fan of Cal Newport, 
uh, who wrote Deep Work and he's got a great podcast called Love Deep Him. Question. Yes. Yeah. You know, he talks about how your quarterly plan should inform your weekly plan, should inform your daily plan. And right. that that can get a little overwhelming quick, but I think the concept is probably one that all of us could learn from. Just this idea, let's stop pretending that we're clever enough and smart enough to know exactly what we need to do at a given moment. And right. that's why I think those quarterly, weekly, daily uh, views, ultimately they build that momentum, which overcomes tiredness, overcomes a full schedule, overcomes lack of willpower, which those things impact all of us. I mean, you know, I had a full day of meetings yesterday off site. I was so tired this morning, you know? It'll and, do that to you. Right? Yeah, yeah. But thankfully, I have, you know, a good weekly plan. And I, I at least had a sense of what I hoped to do on Thursday, February 3rd, when we're recording this. So, yeah, I mean, just you've got to find what works for you, but have a simple approach to task management. Well, uh, a, a side question, uh, personal curiosity, like you, I, I enjoy the the digital format of uh, to do list. In fact, I use OmniFocus, so I'm going to ask you kind of what your to do list <laughs> preferences are, but also that kind of handwritten journal. And it sounds like you use both, but can I ask you on the the digital app side, what do you like sure. for to do list? Gosh. I have tried them all, I think, <laughs> you know, so well, I figured our, you'd be the right one to ask. <laughs> <laughs> so our organization has tried a number of project management tools. Um, we're currently using one called Active Collab, which I really, really enjoy. And they have a great discount for nonprofits. Okay. Um, so that's been great for us on the project management side. Personally, right now in February, and this will probably change as of next month, but <laughs> I, I'm not uh, proud of that, but I am honest. I'm using an app called TickTick. And okay. um, TickTick allows for Kanban boards. You can pin tasks to the start of things. It's got um, a nice ability to time block, which I know we're going to talk about. And you can simply drag tasks into a calendar. Um, so on the side, I will acknowledge that I am one of the beta testers for OmniFocus 4. Wow. Uh, and I'm, I'm really enjoying seeing uh, where the app is going. And I love OmniFocus. So powerful keyboard shortcuts out the wazoo. Um, so I love it. Do you, and have you been using OmniFocus for a long time? Pat? I have. And yeah. so I can't claim like you to have really tested comparisons, but I, I started using it like it. I guess I'm using three right now, Mike. And but I do like the ability to, you know, the the context, different contexts, and mm -hmm. the, the ability to reorganize your list. And, and it it, yeah. it uses David Allen's methodology, I believe, right? right? So yeah. that oh yeah, is something you and I are going to appreciate as well. So powerful, and the review feature to me is a killer feature. You know, to review all your projects and just hit that review button. Wow, I, I wish other apps would do that. I could not agree more. There's just <laughs> something about that feature. And speaking of the weekly review, that's exactly what I utilize in that setting. But mm -hmm. all right, well, back to the countdown, Mike. You gave <laughs> us some kind of task management advice and ideas. Mm -hmm. Time blocking, indeed, I think is your second area. So what do you mean by time blocking? Okay, so time blocking just simply means you're matching time on your calendar with the task. And I, I, I will acknowledge that I resisted this for decades. Um, and then when I started working from home, I was very conscious of, am I actually doing enough work? And so I would just simply map out uh, my day. And I use now the full, the focus digital planner from uh, Sean Blanc and the suite setup on my okay. iPad. I use an iPad pencil and it's simply, you know, I come up with my list of things to do as informed by my weekly plan those go on there. And then I will put in the hard rocks in the landscape. So I had a meeting at 10, this calls at 11. I've got one at 3.30, one at 5.45. So I put those into the calendar and then I know, okay, well, maybe I've got a block, maybe I have two blocks of an hour after lunch before that 3.30 meeting. Okay. So then I'll take a task and I will literally draw a line to that box. Uh, and then I'll take the next task and draw a line to that box. So the idea is 
I think many of us, we are very unrealistic with the things we can get done in a day. And so yep. we'll start the day with a list of 10 things when actually there's only maybe two or three real focus head down blocks to do those things. And then we get to dinner time and we feel unaccomplished. We feel right. as if, gosh, I, I didn't get all those things done. Well, we probably got a lot of things done, but we didn't build it well and thoughtfully on the front end. So time blocking just, it adds honesty and commitment to the things that we want to get done. And again, every, I've never met a nonprofit leader who isn't really productive. And I'll say that time blocking can take their productivity to the next level. Cause it's just being honest about their commitments and it gives you the ability to say no to things. You know, I, I said no to somebody this morning. I said, I would love to be part of that research project. I just literally but, don't have the space right now in, in what our organization is doing. So that's it. Just time blocking is taking your day, uh, but putting the chunks in it that already exist around the, the hard landscape I, items from your calendar, and then just making sure you, you have a sense of the, the amount of time that a task takes. And some of them are really short, one minute, two minute, three minute, but some of them take 35 minutes of focused work. Some of them take 45 minutes of focused work. The other thing I'll just say before I shut up is about time blocking. Um, this also helps your team because it helps you appreciate the head down time, thinking time, um, deep work time of your teammates. Yes. And so, you know, that, that one-off phone call at nine in the morning to Sandy, I might rethink that because I know that she values her time in the morning and maybe I can put it into a project management app and then she can get back to me at her leisure, you know? So that's the other beautiful thing about time blocking. It helps your team and it helps you to appreciate the time of the members of your team. That was such a good point. And I'm glad you of course reference uh, our friend Cal Newport and the need for deep work, which I believe so many nonprofit leaders do not allow on their calendar. And, and it's so easy to get caught up, particularly as you get more senior in the organization that your, your entire week can be consumed by these meetings. And you're right. Then you're wondering, well, how come I didn't get anything done? Well, maybe because you allowed these meetings to take your calendar over. And so I, I love that, Mike, in terms of you need to control your calendar, right? You need to put these uh, times on your calendar to assure uh, the deep work is done. The high quality objectives are accomplished. So uh, great point. And I'm glad you, uh, of course, reinforced it. Um, all right, let's jump to the third one. Um, similar to your to-do list, the morning routine, uh, I think, is one that is critical. Talk about what you suggest in terms of building a better morning routine. Yeah, I think a morning routine is, is so important because it just, it gives you momentum to start the day. Um, so, you know, for me, I was a school guy for a long time and nobody who runs a school, I mean, you just have to get to school early. You just have to, you know? Um, and so that's where I really think that I learned this, this idea of trying to have some kind of a morning routine. I'm not sure the components matter that much, you know, I mean, whether it's 15 minutes, 45 minutes, whether you're exercising or having some quiet reading time, whether you're journaling, whether you're lifting weights, I'm not sure those matter. I think they're all probably good. Um, whether you're walking the dog, you know, whatever it might be. I just think that it's so important to take some pride in a morning routine um, because it will help clear the deck. It will help you think forward to the day ahead. Um, I have a, a dear friend of mine and uh, he's a, a faith-based leader. And I asked him how he started his day. And he's somebody that I really, really admire. And he said, I start with the news. He said, I know I probably shouldn't, but I <laughs> right. need to get it out of my head. So then I can have a little bit of quiet time and think through the day. So again, I'm not sure it matters so much the components, but I think the repetition um, just builds in your mind and in your psyche, this sense of, wind me up and let me go, you know, yes. and, you know, like for me, I have a uniform that I wear many days of the week and it's, you know, typically a black t-shirt and a comfortable pair of khaki pants. And, and I don't want to think about that. I just don't, I'll certainly dress up for a meeting, you know, but when I'm off camera or I'm not in person, I don't want to think about that. And I think the morning routine is similar to that, where it's just don't, 
rely on willpower to get your day going. Build a morning routine, add some just healthy components to it, whatever it might be, exercise, reflection, uh, fitness, nutrition, whatever it might be. Uh, so I think that's really critical in terms of a good productive day is getting a good morning. Yeah, I love that. And of course, I'm debating with my young adult son as he is the classic uh, slap the alarm and then race out the door. <laughs> and that's kind of your point, right, Mike? If we're, if we're yes. racing into our day without any kind of thoughtful prelude. Yes. In fact, I was going to ask you this. You and I, I know you see this too, that you know, there's a lot of advice. All right, don't check your email or you know, don't allow yourself, I guess, to get distracted. Is that, uh, are you intentional in your morning routine about not watching the news, maybe like your friend or not checking email or anything like that? Well, yes, with one exception. I do check ESPN and uh, SI.com every morning because I, I'm just, I love sports. I yeah, love good. athletics. And so, and I find that that's fairly um, innocent. You know, it's, it's not going to take me down a rabbit trail by watching, you know, the latest just slim, the scores. Slim dunk. Yeah, 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 right, yeah. Right. So that's the one exception. I do need to be. I like the news. I I, I was a politics major for a couple of years in college. I, I love politics. I love current events, but lately I've found I need to be careful with that. You know, because it can be upsetting, or I can be tempted to chime in on social media, and I find that never goes well. So, uh, so just the just sports news. Um, otherwise, I try to keep it to you know self improvement, personal development stuff. Yeah, good. I thought you might be in that guy, and I'm equally guilty. Uh, <laughs> I cannot resist seeing who won the game last night. That I had to go to bed before the game was over. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right, well, let's move to number four, and it's one that you've lifted up and I guess would reinforce this weekly review. And again, curious, when do you do your weekly review? Uh, just, uh, again, learning from your rituals. Sure, I do a weekly review Sunday night. And so for me, that's just been, I don't know, kind of my sweet spot. And I have a number of things that I, I go through. It takes me maybe 30 to 45 minutes. I'll check the kids' school newsletter email. Okay, I'll do that. I'll check last week's calendar, this week's calendar. Okay, um, we've got family time every night. I want to make sure I've got, you know, at least I have a sense of what I'm doing, you know, each right. night to help with the family. And then I'll go through the, the list of projects. Um, so that really works for me. I use a, a combination of the digital tools like we talked about earlier. I use a nice um, leather notebook where I will just kind of write out my commitments, you know, like, where are we with the kids and do we have any house improvement things, you know, so in OmniFocus, maybe these would be, would be like areas, right. areas of focus. Um, I find writing them out helps me. And usually my wife's in the same room so I can say, Hey, what about this? You know, and, and it lets me look back over the prior week and say, you know, that wasn't bad. It wasn't bad. I, I have an accountability a friend and coach, we talk every Monday at 11. And it helps doing the weekly review the night before, because I could say, you know, last week was was tiring and stressful and hard, but it doesn't mean it was bad. You know, right. it was a good productive week. It just was a, a, a full week, you know? So that's it. 35, 45 minutes on a Sunday night. Um, when I don't do it, I really miss it. You know, I really not agree more Monday. I just don't feel prepared. And I, I don't like that feeling of, you know, like I don't have dreams where I show up, you know, without the right clothing or <laughs> my, my nightmares are I show up to a meeting and I'm not prepared, <laughs> you know? Yes. And that weekly routine, that, that, uh, weekly review keeps you from having those nightmares, right? I yes, hope. yes uh, absolutely. Yeah. Love that. Uh, well, and, and I, I, we could have a fifth and maybe there will be a bonus sixth item on our <laughs> list, Mike, but the fifth, I love the, the phrase you use calm calendaring, mm. calm calendaring. What do you mean by that? And why would you put it on this top five list? Well, okay. A couple things. So first of all, I think the default for a lot of nonprofit leaders is the way we make decisions is we have to have a meeting. And I don't agree with that. I think meetings can be a good thing. Oftentimes aren't. I think that um, people need time to think about things and chew on them and process them. And I think for many, many years, we've just figured, you know, put some smart people in a room and magic will happen. <laughs> so, 
So I, I, I mean, you have plenty of meetings. I have plenty of meetings. I'm not against meetings, but I think that uh, having more appreciation for the other person's schedule and having a sense that, you know, the meeting is not just your time. If there's three people, it's a three hour meeting. You know, if there's 10 people, it's a 10 hour meeting. Yes. And take all of their salaries, take the zeros off, divide it by two. That's actually what that meeting costs, you know? Good so point. They're, they're very expensive. They are precious and let's keep them precious. And so with that said, that probably means we ought to have fewer meetings. When we do have them, we want to be prepared for them, have an agenda in advance. We want to make sure we've got time so that we, you know, we're showing up a little bit early. We can get the coffee or the water, whatever it might be, get comfortable. If you're traveling, you know, we can make sure we have time to find a parking spot and, and you know, get checked in and that sort of thing. It also means that we're allowing for a little bit of space after the meeting. You know, the other day I had a, like two and a half hours straight on Zoom. I just needed to step away for like 30 minutes, you know, go walk the dog, go whatever. Understandable. Think, yeah. yeah I, I think that we need to be, uh, it's good for us to be kind to ourselves related to our calendars. And this is where this calm part goes in. It's okay to say to your team, you know, what? my best time of the day is eight to 10. So you can reach me if you have an emergency, but let's try to honor that in one another I think that's an aspect of calm calendaring. I think adding some buffers in between meetings just to let people recharge is really important. I think too, and I've said this in many, many meetings that I've run, it is okay if we end early. Oh my I've, gosh, I've, yes. Right? I've never met someone who didn't appreciate a meeting uh, ending early. <laughs> and we do not, I was at a meeting last night for my kid's school. It was an hour and a half. It could have been an hour. You know, it really could have right. and uh, without rushing or, you know, hurrying people along. So I just think that um, it's a great opportunity for us in 2022 to look at our calendars and say, you know, do we need a meeting or can we, you know, use Slack to put some ideas back and forth? Um, and it's fine if we need a meeting, but let's just be thoughtful about that. Let's respect each other's time. Let's make them the length that they need to be and not five minutes more. Um, and that's probably okay. So well put. And my colleague, Lee Williams, will, uh, I bet she's uh, standing and applauding. Uh, she got her <laughs> PhD in literally meeting science mm. and, and talks about exactly what you said, Mike, in terms of um, we, we shouldn't default to a meeting as the answer. Right. And that's why I like your phrase of like, all right, before we immediately issue. And again, as the leader, of course, you can kind of force your team to come together for a meeting, but you're saying, all right, but let's take it easy for a minute. Maybe you don't have to put all these uh, valuable timed uh, employees into a room together. And also something else, Mike, you alluded to this, and Lee has often said this, that, that we default a lot of times to our calendar program that for an hour. Right. And right, should we be more thoughtful and say, all right, if we're going to do a meeting, let's do it 30 minutes or 45 minutes, right? Or some variation and not just mm -hmm. because the meeting will take the full time if you allow it. And it's totally okay to say to people, you know, I think this is, this could be a 10 minute meeting. It's fine. If it needs to be a little longer, you just plant that seed that this is, this is fast food. This isn't a five course meal. Good <laughs> point. Know? Good point. Um, the, the other thing, Pat, and I would say is that I think it's so important. I think we undervalue the power of the written word. Uh, what I mean is I'm, I'm finding more and more people that we look to hire for our organization. We want to see how they write. Not just if they're great in an interview. And I think it was Jason Fried, one of the co-founders of Basecamp. Uh, you know, he said, if I had to hire two candidates who are, you know, similar talent level, I'm going to hire the one who can write better. Interesting. And I think, I think what that does is it forces people to put their cards on a table. In a meeting, it's easy to say, I don't think we communicate well enough as an organization. Okay, well, what do you propose? Put it in writing. It forces the person to think it through and to commit because words are cheap, but things in writing, they cost us something. They cost us intellect. They cost us time. So I would just, you know, and, and I have to continually encourage, I have some really strong extroverts on my team and I have to continually say, I want you to write it out 
even if it's just a paragraph and then let's talk about it. And I find that makes for a better conversation. That makes so much sense. The efficiency of that and the clarity, I bet they get in their own mind because you're right. Some people that are very eloquent can talk for, uh, or they just talk on and on and on. <laughs> and <laughs> and I, I had a board chair once in one of the roles I had who famously said, if, if you can't put it in writing, in fact, within one page, I'm not going to read it. And so it was both put it on paper, but also be efficient and effective. And it seems to me that, Mike, you're agreeing. We need to have better communication Definitely. skills if we're Definitely. going to be non private leaders. Especially as written skills. Absolutely. Yes. yes. All right. Let's give them a bonus. We got a little more time here. Um, you also talk about the importance of restorative downtime. So let's mm. add a sixth item, a bonus item to there Mike's list. Bonus item. Uh, what do you mean by restorative downtime and how do you employ that? Yeah, I think if you work with your brain, do something with your hands. If you work with your hands, do something with your brain, you know, and, and I, of course, I'm being overly simplistic, you know, it, the, you know, I know I have a friend who, uh, for a hobby, he builds surfboards by hand. Now, of course, that's using a lot of brain power, you know, so I don't mean to oversimplify, but as you know, probably a lot of nonprofit leaders are, are knowledge workers, um, they're thinkers, they're paid for their, their brain and their decisions, et cetera. It's so important when we are officially not working to do stuff that's not work and things that activate different parts of us, being outside in nature, doing a hobby, spending time with our family, friends, pets, if you have them, working and, and working on projects that you like, not just the honeydew list, not just the errands on a Saturday morning, not just, you know, shuffling kids to practice, but like really things that feed you, you know, and that could be golf. It could be woodworking. It could be cooking. I mean, gosh, it could be almost anything, but that is so critical. And especially in kind of this zoom friendly age we're in and I'm an introvert. So I love working from home. I find meetings exhausting. Yep. Um, yep. And like, I'm loving this conversation that we're having and when it finishes, <laughs> I'll need like five minutes just to kind of like decompress and regain my composure. So I think this idea of restorative downtime is so valuable, especially in 2022, because we don't have to work all the time. It is okay to work 30 productive hours in a week or 35 or 40, the days of 60 and 65 and 70, where if we're honest, 25% of that is not really that <laughs> much working going on. Right. It is okay to work hard, focus, really, really crush it during the week. But when the clock turns off, do things that just feed you, do things that are restorative, you know, watch, don't, don't just binge watch things, watch something that you really love, you know, that you really, it puts a smile on your face. Um, so that's just something that I think helps us be more productive during the week when we can rest in the times that we're not working. So well put, Mike, and, and kind of brings us full circle. You know, we both talked about at the beginning of this conversation, the overwhelm, the fatigue, the exhaustion that many of our listeners may feel. And I think that's why this kind of the, the concept of restorative downtime and being intentional about it is such good advice. And I hope our listeners uh, will take heed to, to just that. Um, uh, lots of great feedback. Uh, again, I'm going to encourage our listeners to check the show notes because there's going to be lots of things to, to remind you about. Uh, and thank you for that, Mike. I, I guess one final bit of, of advice would be, you know, the people that approach you and I both about getting into nonprofit leadership, any final advice you'd offer someone who's pondering mm -hmm. that? Well, it's hard being a nonprofit leader. You have to have a, a strong constitution and you have to be really committed to whatever cause you're drawn to. So I would just say that on the front end, this is hard work. It's not like, ooh, the tech world is hard and nonprofits easy. No, <laughs> nonprofit leadership is really hard. Good point. And, and gosh, so satisfying. So I would just say, if you, if you catch a glimpse of a nonprofit or a nonprofit leader that just resonates with you, it speaks to you, um, find out more you know, talk to them. How did they get into it? That's why I love your podcast is you kind of probe guests to tell us the story, you know, what's your origin story? How'd you get into this? So right. I think just that, that curiosity of how people got into their work and why they really enjoy it. 
um, don't let go of that curiosity. And maybe you can take a step. Maybe you can volunteer. Maybe you can start uh, your career doing a formal role where you're paid for it. Or maybe you can serve on a board. I mean, there's a lot of opportunities, thankfully, at all the different stages of our lives to contribute to nonprofits. Um, so yeah, just feed that curiosity, take one step further, and recognize that there's a lot of need in our world. There's a lot of people who are hurting, a lot of people who are lonely. Um, that's something that, you know, our work, we, we do a lot in terms of the loneliness factor of, of students on college campuses. And that's just one part of, of the human race, you know? So there's a lot of need and a lot of good that you can do and just take one more step. It's fantastic. Uh, again, could not agree more. And that curiosity, the lifelong learning, that I see in, in the most successful nonprofit leaders I deal with, I think exhibit exactly what you just said. And that I think kind of fulfills them and nurtures them and helps them. So they don't deal with the things we started this conversation with, you know, the exhaustion mm -hmm. and all that. So mm -hmm. Mike, thanks again. If I can ask for a parting gift, as you know, I ask each guest to share, and I know you got lots of books that you could mm -hmm. ponder and choose, but is there one maybe you'd lift up and recommend to our listeners? You bet. Yeah. It's a book that I'm reading right now. It's called A Minute to Think, subtitle, Reclaim Creativity, Conquer Busyness, and Do Your Best Work. And the author is Juliet Funt. Uh, she's been doing a book tour recently. I just came across this on the Carrie Newhoff podcast, and I really like it. Tons of great productivity advice, especially in the, in the area of, like we were talking about meetings. Right. She's got a whole section on email. It's really fascinating. So that is definitely a book that I can recommend. A Minute to Think by Juliet Funt. Love it. Uh, I'm putting it on my personal wish list already. I can already <laughs> tell from your description, it's one I need to get my hands on. So <laughs> thanks for that. And, and Mike, where can people find out more about you and the great work you're doing in the nonprofit sector? Folks can go to my website, nonprofitproductive.com. And I have currently a, a new resource called the Ideal Week Template that folks can download for free. It just gives you a simple way of thinking about your week, theming your days, and you can print it out and use it. I've heard from a lot of folks, they just find it just gives them just what they need to think through their week and then follow through on their commitments. So nonprofitproductive.com is that spot and the Ideal Week template is the resource. Fantastic. Could not agree more and we'll highly recommend it. Mike, you've got great content. I've seen it through your website and social media channels. So I'll encourage our listeners to do just that. Thank you again for joining me on the path. My pleasure. Well, I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Mike as much as I did and came away with some practical ideas that can not only help your organization, but frankly, help you be more effective at doing the kind of work you want to do. Don't forget the show notes. They are available on our website, PattonMcDowell.com. This is episode number 146, and you can find all you want about Mike, the great tools and tips he's lifted up in this episode, as well as connecting with him and his great nonprofit productive organization, which is literally a wealth of resources. As always, please share this episode with someone else on the path. And if you haven't already, you can subscribe. Just go to the podcast page at patmcdowell.com, the new podcast page at patmcdowell.com, I'll add, and go to the follow button. That's what subscribing is called now, follow button, and that'll take you to all of the primary podcast platforms. Don't miss out on any of our weekly episodes. They come out every Thursday. And if you like this episode, click on the episodes button at the top and you can scroll down through all of what now amounts to 146 wonderful conversations. Thanks for all you're doing in the nonprofit sector, especially right now. And keep up the good work for causes that are most meaningful to you. I'll keep bringing you content that can help you do it even better. Have a great week and I'll see you next time on The Path.